Welcome, Wendy. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Nate. Okay. Well, I, I, um, I, we have some, still have some people in the in the waiting room, which we will uh, continue to bring into the meeting. But uh, let us get started, as we have a full agenda ahead of us. Welcome everyone to this Wash for Work uh, webinar. And uh, this Wash for Work webinar in partnership with Limnotech uh, to really go into a deep dive uh, into our wash benefits accounting framework, which was just launched earlier this year. If we could, could go to the agenda slide, please. Juliana, thank you. So we will kick off with a brief introduction um, uh, of the framework, but we really want to spend today uh, spending time uh, getting into the guidance for application of the framework to your WASH projects. And um, as outlined uh, in the reports um, that, um, that outline the framework, there's a four-step process that we've recommended. And we've structured our webinar today uh, along these four steps. Uh, in how to apply the framework. Um, and uh, we will do a combination of, uh, of Wash for Work and Limnotech um, uh, sharing insights and guidance into those steps. Uh, we also, in these webinars, um, like to explore how to apply the framework to different types of wash projects in different geographies. And we've asked um, a, a piloting company for each uh, webinar to, to share how they've applied the framework um, to their WASH projects during the pilot phase um, that we went through uh, to develop the framework last year. Uh, and uh, we've had um, uh, different piloting companies uh, in the past. And today we're really pleased to have Orbia uh, uh, joining us by video to share how they applied the framework to their WASH projects in Latin America with their implementing partner, UNICEF. So let's jump right in. Next slide, please, Juliana. So the objectives of this WASH multi-benefit accounting framework um, were uh, really to align with the other multi-benefiting benefit accounting frameworks that um, companies are using uh, to calculate uh, the, um, the impacts and outcomes of their uh, corporate water stewardship uh, activities. And, uh, and so we're really happy to have partnered with Limnotech on this, uh, who have been uh, experts in helping to, to also um, develop the other corporate water stewardship multi-benefit multi accounting um, framework so that this WASH framework sits very nicely um, within the suite of multi-benefit accounting frameworks. Um, in particular to WASH, uh, it was the ambition of the, the project team, which is a, a multi-stakeholder team uh, where we went through an 18 month process to develop this framework. It was really important that this framework focus on the um, outcomes and impacts uh, of uh, investments in WASH, WASH activities, which gets us to our multiple benefits. And there was also an importance placed in this framework um, to, to really uh, align with um, evolving leading practice in WASH, which includes climate resilient WASH, gender equity, uh, and financial ROI. Next slide, please. So the first question we get often is, what are these multiple benefits uh, of WASH that we're, we're looking to calculate uh, in this framework? And again, beyond the outputs of direct beneficiaries, uh, this framework will really help you to calculate the benefits um, along these three uh, elements of socioeconomic benefits, environmental benefits, and institutional benefits. For example, uh, in environmental benefits, how um, do your WASH projects um, also contribute to your environmental goals for, for water quality, for example? You know, how do WASH um, outcomes also um, improve climate adaptation and mitigation? In, in terms of socioeconomic um, indicators, uh, we uh, looked at health and well being, um, education, gender equity, um, et cetera. And in institutional, um, we leverage some of the uh, new um, um, evidence of financial return on investment uh, of WASH projects, uh, as well as uh, community resilience, just to name a couple of those. Next slide, please. 
And so then how do you calculate the impact of WASH access benefits? Um, well, if you're familiar with other multi-benefit accounting frameworks, you'll be familiar with this uh, impact pathway, which we've also leveraged for WASH. And really important to calculating benefits, of course, is the data that goes in <laughs> to those calculations. Um, and that for WASH really depends on the activity, the WASH activity um, that your, uh, your project is covering um, and the outcomes and impact uh, targets um, that you have um, set as goals for your projects. And uh, the data that goes into that then helps us to calculate the multiple benefits of WASH. Next slide, please. So, What's inside the, the reports? Um, there are actually two different reports uh, that you'll find on our Wash for Work and CEO Water Mandate websites, uh, I believe, as well as Limnotech's um, website. And the first report is um, an introductory um, uh, report really aimed at uh, corporate water stewardship practitioners, um, your sustainability teams, to give a, a high level of how uh, WASH benefits accounting fits into your overall um, water stewardship impact uh, reporting um, and accounting strategies. Um, and it does outline the four-step process um, that we're, we're going to go through today. Um, but really, as mentioned, um, the guidance for how to apply um, the framework really lies in this um, second report, the standardized methods report, um, which goes into detail on the indicators and accounting methods that you can use to calculate those, um, those WASH multiple benefits. And today, um, Limitech will guide us through what's in this report, um, referencing uh, the WASH project that we will hear um, from our, um, uh, our, our corporate piloting company, Orbia. Next slide, please. So here is the four-step process that is outlined in that introductory report. Um, how do you get started it is really critical to, to being able to um, calculate those benefits and how you create a baseline um, to collect the necessary data you, you will need to calculate those benefits. And this is a key point. And I, I think unanimously across all of the companies that piloted the framework found that um, this was really critical, um, that um, all of these multiple benefits that can be calculated um, from uh, WASH uh, outputs, outcomes, uh, and impacts um, really need a baseline of where you've started from to, to calculate. And so really um, thinking about the outcomes and impacts, the multiple benefits that you want to be able to calculate at the beginning of your, the design of your project becomes really critical. Um, and so that's why we've um, put uh, in the, the introductory report this, this four-step process really to, to guide you on what you're going to need um, to be able to calculate these benefits really starts um, up front with the design uh, of the project. Um, and so in step one, um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. In step one, um, really this is about understanding your WASH risks and identifying the gaps in WASH access that you want to address through different WASH activities or projects. Um, and we've given guidance in the introductory report um, on this of, of how um, many companies do this, um, how they identify WASH risks for the business, um, identify those gaps and priorities for actions, um, but also understanding the, the local context of, of WASH challenges um, for, uh, for different areas of your, your operations, supply chains, and for the communities where you operate. Step two, if we can go to the next slide. Step two is when based on that, after you've prioritized um, the areas you wanna take action on WASH to help define that, um, that WASH project um, from its goals, activities, um, and partners. And this is the starting point of that baseline of data that you will need to, um, to capture to be able to calculate um, benefits. Again, that activity that you've chosen for your WASH project um, and the data associated with it before you get started um, with your WASH project, really critical to calculating these benefits. Next slide, please. And so what is a WASH activity? This is where our multi-stakeholder process really um, benefited uh, this, uh, this framework. Uh, so we had a, a group of companies um, and WASH expert partners advising 
on um, different types of activities um, that are considered leading practice on, on WASH. Um, and those include water access, sanitation ac access, um, and hygiene access. And we do point out in the, um, in, in the introductory report that um, the optimization of benefits comes when all three uh, of these different uh, uh, areas of uh, water sanitation and hygiene are taken together. Um, but the report provides this outline. It's going to be too small for you to read uh, in this slide, but um, it just as a, a placeholder to share with you um, that the detailed descriptions of the types of activities that are considered leading practice on WASH are listed in the reports. Next slide, please. Ah, and <laughs> so um, after introducing you to the framework and going through steps one and two, which are outlined in the introductory report, um, we'd like to invite uh, um, Susanna Margolin from or Orbia to share how they applied the framework to their WASH project in Colombia, in South America, um, with their implementing partner, UNICEF. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here today in a virtual setting. Um, my name is Susanna. I am uh, a part of Orbia Corporation uh, as Global Head of Social Impact, and we have been a part of the WASH work group now many years. I'm very excited to have joined last year uh, to participate in this, um, in this pilot for this uh, very, very important framework. Um, Maybe I'll start by saying that, you know, water has always been a top priority for Orbia. It is one of the three world challenges that we think that we are best positioned to support and advance across the world through our operations, our investments and our solutions. So it is something that is very much part of our DNA and we want to make sure we have a very positive impact. Um, Further than that, for the past 15 years, we have been very active in the in the wash space, investing in new uh, water access projects or improving water management systems in local communities, particularly through two of our business lines, building an infrastructure and polymer solutions. And as part of our participation in this framework, um, we decided to pilot a pro project that is very recurrent for us in Latin America. It is a water access project that took place in 2022 in Colombia. Um, we decided to address water access challenges uh, faced by households in a part of Colombia called Soledad Atlantico uh, by installing water tanks and uh, educational activities that would um, promote safe water use and better hygiene practices. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, so Soledad historically houses a large number of vulnerable populations, such as refugees and migrants that have created informal uh, settlements in the area. So there's no access to the water network. And what we saw were that people were being forced to make long journeys to reach uh, or acquire by water uh, and then store it in whatever they could find. We also saw that sometimes formal water tanks had very, um, you know, kind of random uh, timings would go and supply water, but they the population didn't know where they would come. They didn't necessarily have safe spaces where to store it, so they would just grab whatever bucket or bowl was available to store this water that they didn't know, you know, how to keep clean or when it would come again. Um, so uh, this, this problem of, of, of clean water would also then be compounded by the lack of storage facilities where they could keep the water. Um, so our project uh, in partnership with our implementing partner, uh, UNICEF Columbia, uh, aimed to install water tanks, 115 water tanks, which is about 35,000 liters of storage capacity in this settlement or in this in this town um, and then partnered with local municipality governments to ensure that there was a timely deliver of clean water uh, to this population so that they could refill the tanks. There was also um, a lot of educational activities around this where there was a water committee that was created that was in charge of making sure that the tanks were clean properly and that the, the, the sanitation uh, of the towns was made in a, in a regular basis. Um, 
and and just ensuring that this created a informal water system for for this population which reached about almost 3000 beneficiaries most of them children um and so the, the, this is the project that we that we decided to apply the methodology to um now when we started applying the methodology a lot of things uh started to pop out very clearly um so the first thing I would say, especially if you look at the list, long list of indicators, you know, what, what is considered core indicators are already being taken care of, right? This is things that we are already, most of the implemented partners know about, or when you're looking at a project, these are the kind of metrics that you're already gathering and that you're already reporting on. So that's the good news, because then you go into the second set of indicators, which are the advanced indicators, which are a little bit more complex, but really what we're trying to where we're trying to obtain much more information about how far these interventions go. So this is, I think, where a lot of the of the value of this methodology um, lies. Um, and so, uh, so when we started doing this, we we kind of had a, a special approach because we were applying this methodology in a project that had already finished. So the things you can do with it are a little bit limited, and never had we seen before such this important element that. You know, the design phase of a project is so key to make sure that you're including all of these different elements beforehand so that then you're reporting on them properly. Um, but where we, you know, having having this experience of applying the methodology to a project that had finished, what we had the opportunity to do was really take our time with the advanced indicators and go through them very quickly and or, sorry, not very quickly, very detailed and, and, and understanding them deeply because the the value here is understanding what other co-benefits besides your usual suspects, I would say, which are all kind of in that core uh, bucket, uh, but what other um, issues you are positively impacting through your intervention. And uh, so we took a, a, a look at the list and started selecting those that made the most sense for our overall strategy as a company, but also to the specific context of that particular project, right? And, and, and we decided to focus on some of the indicators that revolved around um, health, uh, gender and overall development. So things like, uh, you know, does schooling get affected for children because of water situations um, in, in, in the community? Or, for example, the overall hygiene uh, possibilities for girls and, and, and women in the community um, that are tied to water access. Um, so those, some, some of, those are some of the things that, that we decided to focus on. Um, now, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but this project that we chose is actually a recurrent project that we that we um, that we perform um, several times in different communities, always with our implementing partner. Right. So we also kind of selected that because we knew that whatever we learned from applying it to the project in 2022, we would be able to apply again in forthcoming interventions. And so that is exactly what we did. Um, and and this year we've we've already uh, applied it to a couple of projects that are happening in the region and soon we will be able to have kind of information on of course further learnings from applying it on a live project but also uh you know kind of the the the, the feasibility of applying advanced indicators also you know did we select the right ones did we see like a huge change there where we, where there may be other ones where we could have seen a, la a larger uh, improvement that we would want to focus on right so that so that was um that is something that we're really looking forward to applying for next year in in 2025 and as we all know applying this framework some processes is is always an, an ongoing an ongoing um, situation where you can kind of take the learnings and apply them for the next run. Um, I, I do want to stress here just how important our partnership with um, UNICEF has been. And not only did they pilot the methodology with us last year, and there was a lot of back and forth and going back into finished projects and obtaining data to make sure that we that we were able to go through the through the motions of the methodology, but also just as thought partners on you know, what are the right indicators to look at? What is the source or the methodology that you're going to use to get those indicators, right? So we found that a lot of the indicators that we were most interested in were indicators that you would get via sur survey. So of course this during the design phase of a project, you know, requires um, a more investment, more resources. So sometimes you say, well, if you're gonna already invest in surveys, you might as well kind of select three or four 
um, that are going to be gathered via survey so that you kind of leverage that, um, I would say, additional investment to your planning phase. Um, but we also brainstorm on, you know, if we're going to be looking at health data, is this something that this particular local government would have as public record that we could look into? And then maybe just at the end phase, do kind of a uh, an account, like a quick check on, on were, th were those indicators modified or not. So uh, them, of course, knowing the region or having the, you know, the, the, the ground experience, they were able to guide us on whether or not what things would be possible, what things wouldn't be possible. And, you know, as, as it happens with social projects, we now that we're seeing, we're trying to apply the methodology in different countries in Latin America, you know, what was possible for one might not be for the other and vice versa. So it's always a I would say it's it's a little bit more of a of an active partnership during the design phase of of understanding which are the indicators that you're you're going to go after and how are you going to go after them and what's feasible and what's cost effective um and what can actually be tracked so so that that, that was you know very important for us and 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 greatly appreciated to have their partnership and to continue having that as we're applying it on our on our methodology um and I would say that, you know, now that kind of hindsight of the of the project and and some of the challenges that we faced, um, I mean, de definitely not being able to have that kind of baseline for some of the indicators was a little bit of a challenge. But but, um, you know, I think more than challenges, there, there's a lot of opportunities of how you adapt this to your own goals and to your own process. Um, right now, we're you know, we're thinking. How do we link this to other frameworks? How do we link this? You know, we very closely target and um, follow uh, kind of our, our contribution to the SDGs. We have specific targets that we think make the most sense to us. How do we link this to those targets so that we can measure um, progress and impact as as these um, projects kind of happen and 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 continue? Right. So so there's I, I would say there's there's enough information in the methodology we found to give us a guideline and to kind of set us on our way but there's also um, opportunities for a company to select you know the things you want to link it with that make the most sense for you and and the way that you want that you track progress and how do you kind of connect them both um, to make sure that you are reaching your goals and that this is actually he helping you uh, measure track and achieve your goals um, in the in the way that makes the most sense for you um, so we'll we'll definitely keep on knowing more. We're excited to get the results from our new projects that are being implemented and wrapping up in, in the next couple of weeks um, and seeing how this continues to develop for next year. We thank Susanna for um, for sharing with us their experience of um, uh, of how they were able to apply the framework um, to their projects and and great to hear that they're now integrated it into um, into their current um, projects and and future reporting structure. So um, that's fantastic. And uh, I also uh, noted um, Susanna's focus in on the importance of uh, of looking into the indicators and in different um, benefits that you're looking to calculate uh, in the design phase of the project. Uh, happy she was able to highlight that, but also um, she talked about core and advanced indicators. And uh, maybe uh, Nate, um, Nate Jacobson from Limnotech, our partner uh, in, uh, in the development of the framework and, uh, and will now take us through the next steps um, of applying the framework and and uh, Nate, if you could also cover off um, the core and advanced indicators and and how we approach that um, in your remarks based on um, based on what Suzanne has shared with us, that would be great as well. Yeah, we'll Welcome, do. Thanks. Nate. Thanks, Cheryl, and uh, yeah, hello to everyone. Uh, Nate Jacobson with Limnotech, and um, glad to to be joining you today and to be talking through kind of these later steps of the process and uh, I'll, I'll be trying to tie what I share to what we heard Susanna mentioned and some of the indicators that they um, looked at and evaluated and, and maybe um, maybe moving forward with. So um, happy, happy to continue. So where we last left off, Cheryl was talking about uh, you know, selecting your project at goals and activities and working with your partner um, and now, as we also heard Susanna mention um, indicators, 
really before you start your activity, you then want to determine, okay, what indicators and methods am I going to follow and um, collect data on? And how am I going to collect that data? And, and what's the baseline? What's the, what's the without or before project uh, condition? So the report that Cheryl pointed to earlier, the standardized methods report, um, really provides you with hopefully most of what you need to, to do that. Um, we give you a menu of indicators and methods. Um, we like to use that term menu because there are a lot, um, but there's also many different types of projects and there's many different um, benefits that can be seen and different objectives of different um, companies and partners. And so we wanted to give a menu where you can pick and choose and, and decide what fits best for your program and your project. Um, so we've pulled together these indicators and methods um, that can you that can be used to show, you know, what is the change, what is the improvement or the, the reduction or or something that happens because of the project activities. And as was mentioned, we have two categories, core and advanced. Um, core are really the things that we see more as current leading practices, the activities or the, the indicators that are generally relevant across activities that are more commonly collected. Um, we kind of see those as more more essential to monitor and report. Um, and that's kind of what we heard from Susanna as well. So those are the things that they, they were already looking at, they were already collecting. And then, but we didn't want to just stop there. We wanted to go beyond that to what are the advanced, what are the you know emerging leading practice? What are the things that are maybe more project specific or a little more difficult to, to monitor, but we want to be pushing in that direction to better understand um, some of those kind of more beyond uh, more difficult to measure um, benefits and indicators. And um, so we've included those adva as advanced. We uh, note that they're generally more resource intensive. Maybe they're more project specific. Maybe there's not a standard of methods and ways to collect the data. But we've tried to at least take a step towards what would that look like and how would you do that and give you some guidance on that. If we move to the next slide. So just to show you what's in the report um, here for the, the outputs, which are kind of the direct deliverables that come out of a project, you'll see the table in the report that shows the different categories of socioeconomic, environmental, and, and institutional. Um, then the, the outputs that we see, things like increased number of beneficiaries, improved provision of water, um, reduced water demand, and then the potential indicators that can be used with the core bolded um, and the advanced uh, unbolded. And you can see the red boxes there. I just called out a few of the indicators that we heard um, Susanna mention or that Orbia has, had looked at um, for their project of, you know, what, what are the number of systems? How many, how many tanks did they install? Um, what are the number of beneficiaries or um, the volume of water that can be stored and then provided um, to people? So go to the next slide. And I think there might be someone unmuted. So if you could mute, that would be appreciated. Um, and so then looking beyond the outputs to the uh, outcomes and indicate their in, outcomes and impacts, those are the maybe more medium and long-term changes that result because of the activity. Um, but then there's also other factors that play a role. Um, similarly, we've um, included a table and this is just a snippet of that table, just the socioeconomic, but there's also environmental and institutional um, that show the different outcomes and impacts and indicators that can be used in methods. Um, and what you'll notice here, a lot of the, more of these are advanced and a lot more of them have potential, uh, uh, multiple potential methods of, of collecting the indicators. For example, Susanna mentioned uh, their project potentially reducing um, the distance traveled um, to access services. And you can see, you could use a survey to um, determine the average distance that people traveled before and after, or the percentage of the population within a 30 minute round trip walk of the, of the water source. Um, she also mentioned increased school attendance. So are you looking at reported data on the number of missed days per student per school year or um, reported data on the number of children or even you know, go beyond what we have included here and are there other surveys or other, other ways you wanna collect that? Um, so we've just calling out a few of the ones you mentioned here, but these tend to get a little more, uh, complicated and project specific, but we want to take that step to show 
how could you do this? What could, what's the first step you could take? And then you can tailor it based on your, um, your project and, and the data that you can collect. So we move to the next slide, please. So then after you've selected your indicators and methods, you've kind of decided what, what data are we gonna need? What baseline are we gonna use? What are we gonna, what survey do we wanna design? What data do we wanna collect with partners? I think it was really good what Susanna mentioned and that we've heard from many companies of really thinking about this in the design phase. When you're getting the project going, um, allows you to tailor your program and understand the cost involved with monitoring and, and collecting data um, and setting yourself up to actually have good um, good calculation of, of the benefits. So, so you've done that, you've started, you've implemented your watch activity. So now step four is to gather that, that project data and collect your, and calculate your benefits. So the report, um, the standardized methods report includes uh, detailed appendices um, for both the core and advanced. The core include a, a lot more detail. I'll be showing that in a minute, but we're talking about what are the relevant activities that apply to these methods and and how do you how, what are the what are the equations or what are the context you need to know? What inputs and assumptions do you need? Um, and then for the advanced, it's a little more high level, knowing that there's many different ways to do it and there's different project specific things to take into account. So we've tried to provide some guidance to get you going and get you thinking. Um, and then we've also included some guidance on what are best practices for data collection and tracking and reporting of results. Um, as we know, that's something that we also get a lot of questions on of, uh, of you know, how to do that. So we've tried to give some best practices and what we see um, working best, but still giving flexibility there as well. So you move to the next slide, show you what the, um, the methods look like. Small text, don't need to read everything, but I'm just gonna point out a few things and I just encourage everyone to uh, download the reports, take a look and, and, and start using it. Really, that's the best way to, um, to really understand it and get through it is to try applying it to your projects. And you know, as, as questions come up, as learnings come up, please share with us, um, you know, uh, email, communicate with us um, at Limnotech or at um, Cheryl at Watch for Work and we'd be happy to talk through it with you. But um, here, Susanna mentioned, you know, the number of people that they reached or the beneficiaries and, and this is a core method, something that we, we commonly see, but we wanted to um, give a little more context of you know, what are the activities and the indicators. And then the method is very, very simple, right? You know, the number of beneficiaries that directly received, a, you know, the whatever level of benefit, but there's, there's uh, considerations that you need to take into account. Um, so we've tried to um, give some guidance on um, what you would need to collect or what you need to decide. And, and there's different ways to, to even count that number. Are you directly counting the number of people? Are you just surveying people that are reporting an improvement? Are you using secondary data like census data for a, for a village or school attendance records, or even a combination? We've seen, um, we've seen um, you know, like water.org loans where you're, um, you're collecting data on the number of households, but then you're using maybe reported data on a household size or, or people that, that are living in a certain area. So this can look uh, different in, for different projects and different contexts and depending on the data, but we've tried to lay out in detail of uh, what to consider and what data you would need and what decisions you need to make. Go to the next slide. Similarly, another common method that we see relates to volumetric and with WASH projects, volume provided is um, the most common one. And we've made sure to align this report with uh, what you'll see in volumetric water benefit accounting, as well as you know the updates that are being made uh, and are in progress for BWBA 2.0. Uh, but going a little further regarding WASH, trying to provide a little more context on um, how you would apply these methods to wash specific projects as compared to kind of the, the broader um, array of projects that we see with uh, VWBA. So um, we've tried to be aligned and align, you know, what we show here, you see, we give a few different um, approaches for measuring the volume, whether it's, you know, direct measurement or metering or estimating it based on the capacity of the systems or based on the number of beneficiaries. And we've given some additional context on, um, some different uses of water and, and how to how to estimate those the volume per beneficiary 
in there. Next slide. So something I want to call out specifically um, that maybe in our last webinar we didn't focus on as, as, mu as much, but uh, Susanna really focused on the advanced indicators and, and called out that they thought a lot about those and, and considered different ones and, and what data would they need and how would they collect this. And uh, so here you'll see just a few snippets from uh, the appendix in the report, uh, not as detailed as the core. Um, they're more, they're kind of more uh, leading practice. They're, um, you know, maybe more project specific or data specific. So what we've tried to do is um, outline to share the potential methods that could be used and then give some guidance, um, things to consider, resources to use. So for example, when you're looking at the number of jobs created, uh, you know, calling out that you wanna make sure they're jobs that are created directly due to the project activities and not to count uh, jobs that were due to other reasons or, you know, give some examples of types of jobs that are, that are most common as well. Um, you see in the bottom one, uh, I talked about earlier, the reduced distance traveled um, that could be due to the, you know, a few different types of surveys you could collect. And um, we provide some context of, you know, how could, how could you do that? This is not going to be all inclusive, but, you know, maybe you're surveying beneficiaries of the activities, or maybe you're using um, map data to estimate the change in the distance um, from the original source to this new source and, and the target population or something like that. Next slide, please. A few more advanced um, indicators. We talked about school attendance. Uh, so we just provide some more guidance on, you know, working with the local schools or educational partners to get this data. Um, why, how, how WASH activities tend to reduce um, sick days or responsibility of kids outside of school to, to then be able to attend school. Um, and whether that's survey data or reported data, um, you know, just kind of being flexible based on what's available. Um, and finally, I talked about this earlier, you know, increased access to sanitation facilities when needed by women and girls is something that Susanna specifically called out. So, you know, including a survey uh, in your design to, to get that data, but then also taking into account, you know, what does that mean? What does, um, what's the time frame that's relevant? And, and what does it mean to have um, you know, female-friendly sanitation and hygiene systems or what's needed. And so we've included some guidance there from UNICEF that talks about kind of those requirements. And But there's many things to consider and we just try to, you know, get the ball rolling here. Uh, so that's, you know, a quick overview of um, a few of the methods, a few of the indicators that Susanna talked about. Um, there's a lot more in the reports and we encourage you all to use it reach out if you have questions, reach out if you have learnings or improvements or things to add. We really want this to be a living um, document that we can update and, and can be useful for um, really tracking and talking about the benefits that come out of WASH projects. So I will hand it back uh, to Cheryl. Thanks so much, Nate. Um, uh, as you mentioned, a, a lot of a lot of detail there, um, a lot of great um, guidance on different accounting frameworks that can be applied to the different indicators. And, and Nate, thank you for taking us through a, a few of those that relates uh, that related to the example of WASH project that was shared by Susanna from from Orbia. And um, while Nate was talking, uh, I, I did add the links to both reports uh, into the chat. And so if you haven't had a chance to access them or download them, um, please find the links there. Again, there's two separate reports. One is a summary report um, that, uh, that outlines the, um, the process, the four-step process that we've taken you through um, briefly today. Um, and the second report, the standardized methods report is the one with all of the accounting methods and uh, more detailed descriptions of the indicators which, um, which Nate has um, uh, been referring to today. So do download um, both reports and, um, and we hope that you find them helpful. Uh, to repeat, Nate, do reach out if um, you have any uh, additional comments or uh, questions. Um, we will also have time in, a, in just a minute for questions in this webinar. And so if you have those, um, hang on for just a second or put your questions in the chat and we can get, um, get 
get to them on uh, on this webinar or um, or uh, respond to you later. Um, but before we do that, uh, just wanted to share that we're grateful to um, to these. Uh, member companies and partner organizations who agreed to pilot the um, the framework last year um, during its development. These are these uh, organizations have also been part of that project team, the, our multi stakeholder process that I mentioned in the beginning of, of the webinar. And you can find um, more details about their feedback about the framework um, uh, in the introductory and summary report. I uh, wanted to uh, mention a few highlights here, uh, but uh, I think it's a it's a great way to um, to hear other companies' experiences in in uh, in using the framework. And and we hope that um, one of the questions we asked uh, the companies to to report on was um, what were some of the additional benefits that you were able to calculate with this framework. And uh, we think that that's a key value add of this framework, the, uh, the additional benefits and impact that you're able to both um, see um, from your investments uh, and be able to report on um, through the standardized method format. Um, so do check that out. Um, and uh, we are running these webinars as well, um, frequently uh, highlighting and inviting our piloting companies and implementing partners to share their experience and what they learned and how it was helpful to them and um, what it's added to their own um, impact measurement and, and reporting um, strategies and processes. Next slide, please. So here we are at the Q&A portion of our program. Um, we have a couple of minutes to, um, to hear from you if you have any questions. Who wants to get us started? Feel Juliana, free to do we need to, to unmute chat. people? Sorry, Nate? I was just gonna say, feel free to add those to the chat or you know, raise yes. your hand and, and unmute. Happy either way. I'm just checking if uh, people can unmute themselves. Um, oh, we have a hand, Rich. Welcome, Rich. Hi, thanks. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for the webinar. Thank you for the overview of the um, of the guidelines and the framework. Um, I, I think it'll be very helpful um, in the water and sanitation space if, uh, if more organizations are thinking about WASH benefits, um, accounting and measurement um, in a similar manner. Um, I had two questions um, uh, regarding to uh, what additional guidance um, you all might be able to provide on the concept of additionality. Uh, so uh, the importance of um, having the project uh, and counting benefits um, uh, in absence of not having the project available. Um, and then uh, secondly, I guess somewhat related, um, where do contextual factors and assumptions come in? Um, it seems to me of, as you get into uh, uh, potentially measuring counting um, impacts, especially longer term impacts, there are often other um, other contextual factors that may play a role, uh, whether it's positive or negative or, or in, in, in uh, varying directions, positive and negative. Uh, that um, would limit uh, one's ability to be able to uh, demonstrate impact as a result of the intervention, water and sanitation mm -hmm. intervention. So where where does documenting um, those uh, uh, assumptions of of context come into play? Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Rich. I can I can get us started um, uh, and then hand over to you, Nate. Um, and I'll I'll start with your second question because I think I, I need more clarification on your on your first, but. The, your second question was um, uh, was an active um, uh, discussion point in our project team, and and just to also recognize Rich uh, from Water.org. Water.org has been a key partner um, in this work in this in this process, and and so thank you, Rich, for for bringing this up. Um, and and so this is this is um, a key question for the um, especially for the advanced indicators. You know, how can we attribute the wash intervention to a health outcome? Um, for example, and there was quite a bit of discussion uh, on this. So um, maybe I can hand it over to Nate to, to talk about how we how we handled it um, in uh, in the methods. Um, but I think this is an area where we're also you know looking for continuous um, feedback and, and improvement on uh, on where we can uh, advance to 
pinpointing the actual impact of the WASH intervention associated with impacts that um, many interventions um, could have uh, contributed to. But Nick, can you, can you share how we handled it in the report? Yeah, um, I'd say generally what we've seen and, and just from experience and from communicating with everyone is out, outputs, those are very direct, right? Those are the, we you know directly impacted these many people, built this many systems, provided this water. Those require a lot less context, but even in those, in those uh, instances, um, documenting the assumptions and the data sources um, is really important because are you, you know, do you know for sure that these are the, the people or was this based on, you know, some kind of uh, reported census data or, or other things? So, so generally what we've recommended is um, you're going to need to make assumptions in a lot of cases, but how can you um, conservatively make ass assumptions and use, uh, you know, relevant data um, and then just share when you've done that and, and, and try to make that clear. Um, and then in outcomes and impacts, those are the things that are um, kind of further down the line, right? If, if you're doing a project, it's hard to say, you know, is change in school attendance uh, directly because of this? Or is it because um, there's other things going on in other sectors that have, have resulted in that? Um, or similarly with health and, and a lot of things. So um, really what, we're, what we've tried to do is um, give potential assumptions, give potential data that could be used, um, but really recommend using language along the lines of, you know, contributed to or or something along those those sense and, and trying to be conservative when um, when talking and, and, and reporting on what you've done and not saying, you know, we alone did this, but we contributed to, um, you know, improvement in uh, school, school um, attendance or something like that. Um, and I think kind of related to that as well as the additionality question, um, and, and feel free to add on to that question if I don't answer it correctly, but um, generally when we, for these methods and, and for these indicators, what we're looking at is the change, um, the change from the, the pre-project or baseline condition to the with the project condition. So while there's likely other factors that, at play, Generally, what when we're when you're saying okay, the volume provider, the people, um, people reached, or different things like that, it's trying to nail down to directly from the project activities. Um, so without the project, this volume was provided. Now with the project, this volume is provided. Um, without the project, um, we saw these health outcomes, and now in the year since, it's improved by this amount. You know, so it's, we've contributed to that. So. Um, trying to nail down specifically um, what is resulting from the project is 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 the aim, but that's not always going to exactly, you know, it's not always going to be 100% possible to do that. So trying to, you know, be conservative is, is what we recommend. And thanks, Nate. And I'll, I'll just add one more point to that, which I think is important. And, and really the, um, in the design of the framework, it was really important. We had that multi-stakeholder um, process in place for, um, wash expert stakeholders and companies to, you know, to be validating these approaches along the way. And, um, and each of those um, accounting methods then have been validated by, um, by our project team as, as, uh, as an accepted way to, um, to calculate those benefits, um, you know, based on where um, current practice is today. Um, but as you pointed out, Nate, they're not yet perfect in some cases and probably um, uh, uh, why, why your question, um, Rich, uh, to point that out. And I, we know in the case of the health indicators, um, we worked very closely with UNICEF and the, and the project team on this and, um, and they informed us, um, that, uh, there is work going on within the, the joint monitoring program of WHO and, and UNICEF to, you know, help get more defined about the, um, the impacts that we can see directly from, from WASH. So as these, um, uh, as the, the methods evolve, um, then we will be able to uh, include them. But what you will see in the reports is the, uh, a representative of current practice that's been validated by a multi-stakeholder process. Great. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the additionality piece, uh, you know, it's, 
uh, it's important um, to be able to establish, a, you know, a causal link or an association between the activities and the outputs and outcomes that we are um, reporting as organizations. Uh, the additionality piece um, can be tricky sometimes, but it's it's increasingly being utilized in the climate space. Uh, so it's mm. it, uh, so it, it, I think it'll be important for the water and sanitation uh, space over time. Um, it can be tricky. So if um, certain outputs or outcomes would have occurred uh, in the absence of the project or not, but um, increasingly mm -hmm. we as organizations might be called upon to uh, to be able to demonstrate that. So thank you. Great, great point and looking forward to continuing to explore that with you. Great. Um, I see another uh, question in the chat here. Giuseppe, uh, would you like to, sh um, to share with us uh, your question live? Otherwise I can... I can share it with the group and we can we can try and address it. But please, uh, we'd love to hear from you if your if your audio is available to us. So you, you may not be able to unmute it. If you can read it, Cheryl. Okay. Okay, yes. Um so Giuseppe's question for what concerns the sustainability um the new and rehabilitated water systems, the management of the water systems is very important at community level and institutional level. So my question is, if you're providing recommendations on improving the management of water systems and guaranteeing the sustainability of the interventions. Yeah, Nate, do I you want to get started? I'll, I'll just start off that I, that's a really good question. And that's something that definitely came up in the process of, 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 of developing the framework is you know, we don't want to just see projects get built and then not maintained. And and so we've included some language. Um, I have to find exactly what it was, but um, really just encouraging, um, you know, the long-term sustainability of the systems and whatever is done and encouraging, you know, maintenance and monitoring to be included in this. And I think a part of that, um, depending on the indicators that you talk about, a lot of these outcomes and impacts are longer term things. So you can't just um, do something over a few months and then expect, you know, a, a long term health impact to change or or gender equality. You know, it, it really needs a longer term investment. So um, and even even with the uh, kind of direct outputs, right? Like if you're going to be talking about something. Um, over a few years, you, you're going to have to continue to see that, you know, the, the wells well, are going to be set up and ready for those. Doing the wells are going to need to be uh, maintained and continue to provide water and, um, and whatnot. So we've tried to encourage that. And I think that's just a, that's a, a common question that's come up and that, um, yeah, we hope to see the activities, um, you know, being long-term and, and, and sustainable. Um, Cheryl, anything to add I'll, to that? Yeah, I'll I'll add to that. No, great great question, and absolutely one that was um, uh, a big part of our discussions as a as a project team. And we, um, you know, because it hasn't been um, current practice to uh, to follow up, you know, five ten years later to see if those um, investments are, are are still in fact delivering impact. And um, and that was a um, that was a um, a direction that the project team really felt was we should be aspirational about, um, and we know that many uh, of the piloting companies um, have also uh, said in in previous webinars that they will uh, with this framework now they feel comfortable in being able to commit to that um, that long term. Um, uh, verification of uh, of the impact and and really seeing how it compounds um, over time and how those multiple benefits compound over time but Giuseppe um, I see you're you're yes, uh, yes, you're yes. here now Do, would you like to make a comment to be yeah, no, thank you. answer your thank you. question correctly mm -hmm. thank you all, uh, apart from in general for the for the webinar I'm following uh, um, for long now and very interesting. Unfortunately, let's say that uh, very often it happens that after two or three years, uh, the water system are uh, no more functional for uh, several reasons. And this is for my, my, my experience, but also reading uh, UNICEF and other, other papers. Mm. And uh, obviously it's, uh, it's not uh, easy to have uh, you know, a common and general <laughs> approach, but uh, for sure this is a critical aspect, I think, and uh, we, we, should, uh, we should work on it to try to find uh, uh, really, some solution to to reinforce the, the, the sustainability of uh, 
of this uh, this water system because uh, uh, we as, as a company or uh, you know we, we tend to to do very quickly the intervention and uh, and to do end over to with uh, we expect local institution to to follow up uh, at, at community level we mm. Uh, very often it creates, uh, you know, uh, competition between the community stakeholders, you know, the breeders, the farmers at community level, uh, the children. And this is just for, for access to water, but even for sanitation, mm -hmm. uh, very often uh, we, we repair or we build a new uh, bathroom at school, in the schools. But uh, if uh, the school have no budget, uh, then the teacher uh, respond to us that, uh, you know, they keep it the bathroom closed because uh, they, they will not uh, clean up uh, the bathroom themselves. And uh, so the mm. risk that I see and that I really I, I'm willing to improve uh, is uh, to have a long term approach, try to, to work mm -hmm. on, uh, and to, to keep following up, uh, to keep monitoring this intervention because need time to to have then a really concrete uh, concrete uh, impact uh, because a shorter short term uh, intervention then are very risk we create uh, expectation eh? and I, I close now <laughs> yeah but uh, so I, no, I really thank you for your uh, for your work and uh, for sure I will find a lot of uh, useful tips in, uh, in your documentation. Great, thank, thank you. you, Giuseppe, and and uh, and our contacts are are in the reports. But maybe um, Juliana, who's our um, who's our teammate behind the scenes here, helping us to run the webinar. Juliana, maybe you can put the secretariat um, watch for work email uh, in the chat uh, for Giuseppe and and everyone that may not have gotten their questions in today. Um, but Giuseppe, so that we can we can follow up on that um, important point uh, as well. So um, I think we're almost at the top of the hour here, and so I'd just like to go to our final. Um, slide in, in terms of how to engage uh, with us with uh, with the more questions that you that you have or, or specific items you'd like to continue the dialogue on um, and, uh, and in terms of an engaging um, download the reports um, that we put links to in the chat but but also the the wash for work um, work program if we can have the next slide please um, Juliana, um, we also have some key goals for 2024. It's not too late um, <laughs> to uh, to achieve this this year. Um, that we've been reinforcing all year, really, the importance of climate risk for for wash and the importance of you've um, done a, a wash risk assessment, but it's been several years ago, or you haven't done one um, to do a, a wash risk assessment and include climate risk. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of new insights there and we have guidance also through our partners at, at Wash for Work on leaving practice on climate resilient wash. Um, of course, apply this wash benefits uh, accounting framework to your impact reporting um, on wash and, and do let us know um, of your learnings or, or questions so that we can ensure continuous improvement. Um, and finally, uh, we've also launched a program of WASH Collective Actions um, this year, which we've been sharing um, in, our, in our various meetings. Uh, and we currently have opportunities to work together as companies co-invest in WASH projects for even um, bigger impact in uh, locations of interest and current projects that are, are open for engagement are in India, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, and in Nigeria. Uh, so we look forward to continuing um, our partnership in, uh, in advancing leading practice on WASH. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our speakers, uh, Susanna from Orbia and Nate from uh, Limnotech, our partners, and to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining.